You ever wonder how the hell you got fat to begin with? And why you keep gaining weight back and shit? Well, I'm here to give you one of the best controls over that whole fucking process that you'll ever have in your entire fucking life. And shit. This is the live patron live stream and shit. Well, ah, fuck, always got to fuck something up and shit. Well, welcome to the patron only motherfucking live stream. Um, nobody's kind of showed up yet. I don't see any chat in the chat room. So I do have a spiel prepared just in case. Um, and today I want to talk about one of the most powerful hormones in the whole process that the one that we address the most when we fast and when we are on a ketogenic diet and the one we need to control the most and that's insulin and more importantly insulin resistance so i'm kind of wanted to go through kind of as a reminder most of you know this shit but sometimes you just need to hear it over and over again to reaffirm what why we're here what we're doing how we're fixing our fucking health and shit um, I have changed a few things around for this podcast. For those of you watching this after the fact, um, you can subscribe on Patreon for a dollar a month and get access to the Patreon only, or you can wait patiently for me to do this for all of, uh, YouTube. But I do promise these guys a shot at talking, um, and it looks like we have some people showing up here. Uh, let me move that fucking my face around and shit. So, you know, hello, Leonardo, and hello, Steve. Um, same deal as always. I'm going to do a spiel, and then we'll get into some Q&A and, and talk about things going forward and shit and go from there. So let me get into my spiel anyway. So if you noticed on that chat screen you know i made it a little bigger so that we can record the chat w with these live streams so that's one of the changes i've made i've, I've upgraded a lot of, of of shit and i'm working to further enhance my production quality going forward once i finish all my photo editing shit but leaving all that aside we're here to talk about insulin and insulin resistance and i came across a rather remarkable talk on low carb down under let me bring it up here a little uh, rusty, you know, vacations too much and shit. So, you know, 
Dr. Ted Naiman. I, I've, it's a new name I've run across in the field um, from the Low Carb Down Under channel, which posts a lot of talks from different conferences and so on and so forth. Um, gave an excellent, and there'll be a link when I post this to YouTube, there'll be a link in the description to this entire lecture, and I recommend watching it more than once. And while he does skip some of the other hormones, insulin is very important, insulin resistance is why we got fat, and sugar is probably the biggest contributor, and high carbs is, is what got us to store this fat constantly. And eventually just became, became so insulin resistant that we can't even get access to that fat. So, you know, this talk, excellent. And we're going to run through a few snippets of it during this, this fucking uh, podcast here. Uh, or live stream and shit. But I can't stress enough the importance of controlling your insulin. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that. They'll go and they'll exercise, they'll deplete their glycogen, then they'll get hungry immediately and refill their glycogen and have very little access to their fat. And it's important to think about insulin. Now, you can get pretty far in progress by just managing your insulin with fasting alone. You know... The, the, the key to not storing fat is low insulin. If you eat carbs, you get higher fucking insulin. If you eat protein, you get moderately higher insulin. But blood sugar and glycemic load is rather low with that. Which means you're shunting amino acids mainly. And only if you're consuming an excess of protein is your blood sugar going to rise. And then you will store that or convert it to fat in your liver. Um, basically, with insulin, you want it low as much as humanly possible. If you can get away, even if you eat more than once a day and you're not a big fasting person and you're just a keto person or you're just an eater, if you're going to eat more than once a day, you know, you should confine your carbs and sugar to one fucking meal. At the very least, carbs and sugar in one meal with low fat during that meal, too. Um, which is a new thing that I've kind of run into. It turns out when you consume carbs and fat together, you store almost all of the fat that you consume. Um, but we're talking in a high carb, high spiked insulin situation. So, you know, if you're on a high carb diet and you get a lot of fat, you're going to make new fat from the fat. You're going to store that excess fat until the carbs are gone. And then you'll go and you'll pull it out. And you'll be able to switch, you know, as you become more fat adapted, as you spend more time in a low insulin state, you will be able to better switch back and forth and be able to access that motherfucking fat. Um... So, you know, just to get it stoked a little, I want to go through some of the, some clips from this and kind of talk about my thoughts on, on what he's saying. Okay, so now, what causes insulin resistance? Well, we've known forever that the more abdominal fat you have, the more insulin resistant you are. This graph on the right shows insulin levels. You've got normal in green, obese in yellow, and abdominal obesity in red. So we've known that for a long time, right? But what about this? Here's a graph of insulin sensitivity versus body mass index. And how do you explain these people way down here? They've got a BMI less than 20, but their insulin sensitivity is terrible. I mean, what's going on here, right? Well, we've known for over 50 years that the larger your adipocytes, the more insulin resistant you are, right? And in fact, it's a perfectly linear association. Your adipocytes can expand in diameter about 20 times. So if you do, look at a cross-section of adipocytes under a microscope. They can go from maybe 10, 20 microns to 200 microns. Um, that means their volume can expand by 8,000 times. And as they get bigger, they get more insulin resistant. And it's very, very linear. Um, it turns out that large adipocytes are resistant to the antilipolytic effects of insulin. And it's harder to shove more fat in there, right? You can graph out fat. So basically what he's saying here... Um, is 
pretty much fat dictates, our fat sites, our adipocytes, dictates how insulin resistant we become. And there is where the genetics come into play. And a lot of us, you know, three, you know, two thirds of us are prone to this, you know, genetically. We're limited to how many fat cells we actually produce for the most part. There are some people who are genetically predisposed to make more. And then there are some, you know, them skinny motherfuckers that go to McDonald's and shit all the time. And they st still stay skinny, which we're going to get a little further into. But they don't necessarily stay healthy. The, the reason is, is they can't make a lot of new fat cells. So what happens is their existing fucking fat cells become full. They're just constantly stuffing those fucking fat cells with energy to the point where they become so insulin resistant that they won't take fat anymore. So then what happens then is the fat spills out into the body, into the liver. That's how you get fatty liver. Into the pancreas, into the muscles. You get fat cells that just spread out and cause those organs to become insulin resistant. And so then you're in this constant state where even when you're fasted, your insulin's high, you can't get access to your fat cells efficiently for quite a while until, you know, you've been in an insulin, you know, depleted state for a long period of time. That's why people who do intermittent fasting for a long period of time become better and more insulin sensitive um, particularly in fat cells become insulin sensitive because they're ready to grab all of that fat, but you're, you still haven't burned off all of the insulin resistance in your muscles. You still have the fatty liver, especially if you're doing cheat meals and drinking and all of that shit. And you just got to kind of remember that, you know, we're cramming all of this energy into our body that we're not utilizing efficiently or we're not utilizing at all. And there comes a point where we just can't store anymore. And it becomes that fat spillover. And some, you know, things like fructose, for example, overwhelm the system so fucking much that you just are completely making the worst kind of fat. It's spilling out into the liver. It's spilling out into the blood because you've got so much energy coming in and your, your cells are like, fuck you, I don't want any of this energy, you can shove this en energy right up your ass. And that's how we start to become fat, that's how we become unhealthy, that's how we become pretty much metabolically fucked. And it doesn't just happen to overweight individuals, it can happen to thin people. So... Let's let's see what he has to say about that particular uh, subject and shit. By the way, hello, Debra. Welcome. Um, like I said before, I'll get into some Q&A after this if you guys want to talk. Um, but I'll j just let me finish this little spiel uh, and bringing everyone's attention to this doctor who I think is, is spot on. I started looking at some of the rest of his um, videos as well. I haven't gone through a lot of them yet, but... Um, there, there are some things he's ignoring that are significant, which I'll also touch on by the end of this, but, you know, he's got a lot of good science and a lot of clinical data and a lot of studies that he is, is citing here. So let's, let's continue a, a few more clips from this video, but I definitely recommend watching the entire fucking video all the way through if you got some spare time. It's science heavy. Um, it, he is a doctor. He is, um, uh, quoting lots of, of, uh you know, studies and clinical data and trials. So it, it's, I've watched it three times and I'll probably watch it a few more times just to keep sharp on the stuff. So. It turns out that as you get fatter, your fat cells can do one of two things. You can have adipocyte hypertrophy and that's where your fat cell gets overstuffed with fat. Um, and it's inflamed and it's insulin. And that's what I was just kind of, of touching on there is, is, you know, your insulin resistance builds over time as this continues, as we built it throughout our whole life. You start out genetically insulin resistant. We weren't designed to eat a high carb, high sugar diet. Um, you know, agriculture's only been around for 10,000 years. Hunter gatherers weren't eating this way. So, 
you got to kind of keep that in mind that, you know, when you're listening to this part of this talk that that's how we got to where we're at and it's plain as day and proven it, you know by the studies he's pointing out it, it's it's a proven thing resistant and it doesn't want any more fat or glucose or you can have adipocyte hyperplasia if you have the right genetics you can sprout cute new little baby fat cells that are very insulin sensitive and they're happy to suck up more fat and they're not inflamed and they're not insulin resistant so not all your fat cells are, are alike, right? Your ginormous, huge, overstuffed fat cells are super inflamed. They're sick. They're dying. They're spewing out fat constantly. It takes a crap ton of insulin to shove fat in there. Um, the fat doesn't want to stay in there. But your cute little baby fat cells are, are very insulin sensitive, and they're more than happy to suck up more fat flux. Which can be a bad thing if you're one of the fortunate enough motherfuckers that can make a shit ton of fat cells and we're all different in that regard it's a genetic thing um it's not necessarily a good thing that you keep making new fat cells either um however from a met metabolism standpoint and that's why you get this 10 percent of obese individuals who are metabolically healthy is because they keep making these new fucking fat cells to you know stuff the energy into and the new fat cells are insulin sensitive and that keeps that fat from spilling out into the other organs you know the visceral fat the the clogging of the arteries and so on and so forth so an individual and there's not a lot of them 10 percent of obese individuals you know are metabolically healthy for this reason in that they can just keep making new fat cells and keep going now most people aren't in if you have pre-diabetic if you have that you know really round fucking belly it's really hard and stiff and and, and you know you can kind of see it you know you know that it there's insulin resistance at play and you can of course go to the doctor get your liver checked for fatty liver and he also goes over in this video a few other tests that you can uh, do that will give you some markers to determine how insulin resistant you really are. Definitely watch this video. I can't stress that enough all the way through. That's right. So you can have two people of identical obesity and the person who's overstuffed their fat cells and had adipocyte hypertrophy is going to be inflamed and insulin resistant and it takes a ton of insulin to shove any more fat in there, and the fat is constantly spewing back out. Uh, but somebody who can sprout new little baby fat cells is going to stay insulin sensitive forever. If you have the right genetics and you can just sprout new fat cells, this hyperplasia, you could be 600 pounds. And as long as you have some small fat cells around to still suck up more fat, you're going to be totally insulin sensitive. This is about 10% of obese people. See, and he says it right there, 10%. Only 10% of the motherfuckers. So, I think most of us here know that we are not that 10%. I know I am not. I know my weight gain was leading me into pre-diabetes. I know I had fatty liver, not just from overconsumption of sugar, but overconsumption of fucking alcohol. And it, you know, it's not hard to figure out which category you're in. Um, but there is a small category of people that can constantly make new fat cells. Now, there are more skinny motherfuckers that are damaged than obese motherfuckers. And there's a reason for that. You see, those motherfuckers can't make the new fat cells. In fact, they have a set amount their whole life. And when they overfill those, they do balloon up a little bit. You'll see them getting a little bit of pudge here and there. You'll see the round belly starting to pop up on a lot of them. Um, but overall, they aren't making those new fat cells. So what's happening is at a much quicker rate, their fat is starting to spill out because they have become insulin resistant. All of the fat cells in their visceral, or sorry, their um, subcutaneous fat all won't take any more energy so they become sick without even showing it and because they don't show it because we're all caught up in how we fucking look and we gotta have a six-pack abs if you got a six-pack of that you know abs you are healthy and shit meanwhile 40 percent of normal bmi motherfuckers are 
metabolically fucked. They're going to have diabetes. They're going to have cancer. They're going to have heart disease. I know skinny as a rail motherfuckers who have gone through heart disease and stroke. Preventable. Completely preventable. And this last piece, I believe, that I'm going to cite from him is kind of explains that to a degree. So let's check into that here. Okay, the best example we have of adipose tissue controlling insulin resistance is lipodystrophy. Lipodystrophy is a series of disorders where you don't have any subcutaneous fat or hardly any. Um, I have a bunch of patients with lipodystrophy. Um, they're, they're very unique. They have, they almost look ripped like, like a bodybuilder. They have very defined... All kinds of gains and shit. These people are sick. Make no mistake, they're sick. But they don't look it. The arms and legs, they have very little subcutaneous fat, um, but they have... You know, there, there's some fucking fuckmaster pounders there, and I'm telling you, they're sick. They can have a heart attack. They can have, you know, other issues that eventually as they get old and they can't pound the fuck master anymore that it's going to lead directly to obesity or heart disease or cancer or any of these other issues you know as we get older this becomes a problem too anybody who knows that you, you get a set amount of years where you can tolerate it for a while but after a while your ability to tolerate all of that excess energy being shoved into your body just fails and it becomes, you know, I've seen the transformation. People who were skinny as a rail when I was 18, 19 years old that I knew are now obese today. They were fucking, they looked ripped, they looked skinny, they looked great. And now I see them today and they are twice my size, you know. It's, it's because they you can only sustain this behavior for so long and yeah you can keep pounding the fuck master so that you can maintain your looks but that's not going to maintain your health if you're constantly stuffing energy into your body and into your fat cells and you can't make new fat cells then you're fucked have a lot more visceral fat than you would expect. If you do cross-sectional imaging on these people the sub-Q fat in red here is very very small but the visceral fat is completely maxed out and almost every and this is the shit that kills you this is the shit that fucks everything up you know they don't have the big huge they got a little pooch and you see this little pooch a lot in, in the people around you i guarantee you but inside they're a fucking mess because they don't have room to make the fat cells for this pooch to grow bigger and for the ass to come out and the fucking back flaps and the, you know, reverse tits on the back and any other, none of that shit's coming out because all the fat's just filling up the organs and causing them to not be able to take in energy. And, you're, and this leads to you feeling hungry all the time despite this fat being here. You're carrying tons of energy right there, not efficiently, and you're damaged, and your ability, your ability to metabolize fat diminishes as you go on. And that's why fat adaptation takes so long, because you are repairing the fact that your cells can't take in energy from fat efficiently. They're damaged on the mitochondria level. Everyone with lipodystrophy has horrible insulin resistance and horrible, brittle diabetes. All of my lipodystrophy patients, um, really bad diabetes. It's the worst insulin resistance. Um, now, you can buy a mouse that has lipodystrophy, right? We found mice that lack subcutaneous fat um, for whatever reason, and we've bred them. And you can actually buy and sell lipodystrophy mice, and it's a great model for insulin resistance and diabetes because no matter what you feed them, they just completely max. So it, not only is this a, a proven thing, they can duplicate it. They can genetically engineer people to have this lipodystrophy. I'm surprised they haven't put that in a fucking pill yet. Yeah, you can be thin and shit. We'll just stop you from being able to grow new fat cells. Yeah, that'll work. You might drop dead of a grabber at age 25, but you know, you'll be thin as fuck. So, 
that's what we got to keep in mind. So definitely, you know, one of the things he's not addressing that I have to address is the other side of what we are doing. You know, you can manage insulin by doing long fasts. You can keep yourself in a low insulin fat burning state. It takes 48 to 72 hours to burn off all your glycogen and become ketogenic when with fasting. And of course, when you eat, you refill all of that glycogen first, and then you go back to making fat. So you can do the standard American diet with fasting, but what that does not address is the hunger, the self-control and willpower that you're going to need because you're not addressing the other hormones, leptin and ghrelin and, you know, cortisol, and not to mention the mental aspects of the addictions that come with sugar and the emotional roller coaster and then the blood sugar cycle where you get really energized and then you crash and then you get energized and then you crashed. And there's this big fucking shitty cycle that we end up in that he's only talking about one part of. And that's the root cause is insulin resistance. And the cause of that insulin resistance is straight up carbs and sugar too much too often. Shit that we weren't designed to eat too often. He says this later in his lecture. And I agree completely. I've been saying this for a while now. We're not designed to eat the way we are eating. And we haven't adapted to it yet. So what happens when you put humanity in that situation, when you give them a diet they're not adapted to eat, is a bunch of motherfuckers, quite a few, two out of three, getting sick, dying, until all that's left are the people that have adapted, and then they pass that adaptation down the line. I don't know what carb-adapted motherfucking society is going to look like if we continue on this path. I do know there is going to continue to be a worsening epidemic of people dying, of people being obese, of people not being able to function as well in life because of this, of the mental disorders that come with it. There is a whole host of, of problems that could come along with being able to survive on this standard American shit diet that we're eating. Um, we might just naturally have shorter lives as a result of that diet. Um, so it's not all roses. Yeah, well, you can adapt, motherfucker. Yeah, no, we're not going to adapt. Somebody among us will adapt, pass it on to their kids. They'll adapt and so on and so forth. That's how adaptations occur. And guess how long that takes? 10,000 years. You got 10,000 years? I don't. I'm lucky if I got 10 minutes. So that's my spiel. For in, Manage your insulin. I, you know, my advice for this, go keto, obviously. Um, but even while you're keto... Think about insulin, because insulin is a part of keto. If you're eating meat, red meat in particular, I know spikes your insulin. If you're eating you know, your 30 to 50 grams of carbs, especially if you're eating it in one meal, you're going to get an insulin response. Protein and carbs cause an insulin response. When your insulin is up, you are in fat storage mode. You cannot burn fat in a high insulin state. It's impossible. It's a reciprocal. Fat burning and carb burning are reciprocal. If you are burning shit tons of carbs, you are not touching fat. If you switch it up and you're burning shit tons of fat, you are not touching carbs. That's part of the fat adaptation and doing some of the longer fast is getting yourself in this state to where you're burning fat and then you're eating more fat to break that fast and you're staying in that fat burning mode and not fucking with your carbs. That's the whole principle of mixing keto with fasting. You are staying in fat burning mode and you're just switching between the fat that you eat and the fat on your ass. And 
that's the goal. That's how we do weight loss. That's why you sprinkle in fasts with the ketogenic diet because you're giving yourself a chance to access the fat you've been piling on your ass your whole life and you want to get rid of it. And that's what you got to do. You got to sprinkle in some fasts, you know, as much as needed. You don't have to go balls deep into fasting. You don't have to do a 30-day fast, you know. A lot of people get in a hurry. There's no hurry. I've recovered from my holiday fucking shit with just ADF. You know, I'm in my eating window right now. I weighed 190.5 this morning. Um, So I pretty much lost all the way down to where I was before the trip, despite having four fucked up eating days on that trip. Um, I didn't stray too far on the St. Lucia trip because of the small meals and the amount of fasting I was doing there. But... You know, the emotional roller coaster is still, you know, I'm still trying to get off of that. I'm still trying to get away from the cravings. The cravings are subsiding slowly, Um, but it's a setback. And, you know, insulin is the big player. You can get pretty far just controlling insulin, but at eventually your leptin and your other hormones are going to just fuck you into eating whatever the fuck you want to eat and then eating shit tons of it and binges and so on and so forth. Um, That's why I switched from standard American diet and fasting to keto and fasting. It was because I don't want to be hungry anymore. Because sooner or later, hunger leads to binges. You know, anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering and shit. Sorry. We got Star Wars on the mind for some reason. Anyways, so that's my spiel for today. For Thank you for all my patrons who have come. Uh, we got Leonardo, Steve Ingram, Deborah Waltenberg. Let me put it up on the screen here. Um, and put my ass over to the other side here. We always just put me right there. Yeah, that looks pretty fucking good and shit. But um, go ahead and start asking questions. We're going to do some Q&A for a while. I'll try and keep things going. I want to talk about the channel a little bit. Um, so if you're not interested in that, you can tune out if you're watching this after the fact or stick around because sometimes people trigger me and I go off into long spiels. So for those of you who have come to do the Q&A, now's the time and shit um, to, to bring up the questions. I have to talk because there's like a 30 second delay before what we see there and what we see here so anyways we got you know leonardo kiss kiss durin i don't know i fucking butcher name steve ingram deborah waltenberg steven eddy um cat marlette and i think that's it for this patron live stream so we'll start off with cat who has just asked me i have a hard time getting past the 16-hour mark in fasting. Any fucking tips and shit? Well, it's... it's. I assume you're... Actually, if you could answer this real quick. Um, are you eating carbs and sugar or are you keto? Um, that is a very important question. So I'm going to give you a minute to answer that. But um, it's it's a gradual thing. You have to push... You know, as far as you can, and I did this when I did the standard American diet and fasting too, so that I could get up to 36 hours and even a 72 hour fast or two. And that's to keep pushing past, you know, as far as you can, hold out as long as you can um, before you break your fast. Uh, and 16 hours is, uh, is a low end fast. I mean, it's not hard to skip breakfast, it's not hard. Um, there are some crutches you can utilize though, and that is, uh, you know, fat. Fat does not create an insulin response. You do use it if you are, you know, if you're new to fat burning, you might still store it or you might even, you know, have to go take a dump if you eat too much of it. But fat is a great crutch for extending a fast. So adding you know, heavy cream to your coffee or tea or just coming up with some kind of heavy cream to to consume or, you know, coconut oil. I'm not a big fan of eating coconut oil. Butter, you know, come up with a fat bomb, which is just pure fat of some kind 
to push you past that point to to getting a little further in your fast sometimes you can squeeze out a 36 hour fast just by adding fat to the mix and whenever that fat is burned off you immediately switch back to burning your own fat um cat just wrote not 100 percent keto not 100% keto. I'm coming off a holiday binge. The last 24 hours, I've been eating fats and proteins. And you just keep doing that. Um, I would even, you know, go so far as to, if you have the time and you're not in a hurry to get back on the horse, go full on keto without fasting for a while. You know, get used to eating and being satisfied and not being hungry. Because right now you're hungry. If you're coming off of the binge, you are going to be hungry. Even when you first switch over to keto, you are going to be hungry because you are not ready to metabolize your fat yet. You need to fat adapt. Your body is having a difficult time getting the energy it needs. And it, that's important. You know, you got to get the energy. And if you're not getting access to the energy, you're hungry. Your hormones demand that you need to eat. So every time you're craving, every time you're hungry, eat high fat, low carb until satisfied and rinse and repeat. Take a few weeks to do this. You might even, you're, you're probably not going to gain a shit ton of weight. You're going to lose all your water weight, but you will eventually not be hungry. And that is the point where you start increasing your fasting times. So I, my advice to you to get back on the horse Commit to a fat adaptation of six weeks. Strict keto, six weeks. After the first week or two of eating keto, whenever you're hungry, whenever you're craving, you know, then skip breakfast like you have been with the 16-hour fasts. Do that for a week. If you're, Once you're okay with that, you know, you feel like it's easy, then skip lunch and breakfast then you're doing a 22 to 24 hour fast every day. That's the one meal a day protocol. Give yourself a three or four hour eating window so you can take in enough energy for whatever you're doing. But at the, at the same time, stick with the keto. And that is a maintenance protocol, in my opinion, the, the one meal a day thing. And just keep pressing on and then if you want to start moving the needle more or you haven't moved the needle enough with the daily one meal a day that's when you can do things like adf 30 you know my favorite protocol right now is 36 hours on 36 hours off because i feel that gives me enough time of eating intuitively of letting my brain and my hormones balance out and letting my body know Hey, we're not starving to death. No need to panic. No need to make me hungry. No need to make me overeat when I eat. You know, and I'm finding that that 36 on, 36 off paradigm, you know, sometimes 44, 45, because keto makes it easier. You can go longer. There, I don't do just 36 hour fast. I some last one was 42 hours, because it has driven me to that point where you know I'm not as hungry. And when I do eat, I eat pretty much a normal sized meal, maybe overdo it, maybe about 25% larger meal than normal because I fasted, but I still get full a lot more efficiently. I'm giving the body what it's already primed to burn, and that's fat. That's why we eat high fat. You're already you're trying to keep that fat burning mode going. Um, cuz if you overdo it on protein, you're going to up your you're, you're going to spike your insulin, of course, and you're also going to up your blood sugar at some point as you know the excess proteins get converted you know at pretty much a stable rate into sugar when most of that goes into the glycogen because your glycogen's depleted you know and not it doesn't get converted to fructose it gets converted to glucose and then that gets put into your muscles you know it's so you're not turning protein excess protein into fat you're turning excess protein into glycogen and if you overdo that long enough you can get into that territory where you're not in ketosis, but you're still kind of low carbish. Um, but you'll be a lot hungrier because you're relying more, you know, on that reciprocal. You're starting to burn more glucose because you have more of it stored up because you've been overdoing it on the protein. 
And until that comes back down, you know, you gotta keep in mind there's a whole fucking balance going on. And, you know, when you tip the scales in any one direction towards carbs or fat, the other one goes down. Um, and our the object of the game is to be in that fat burning mode and have the carb burning mode down here. And you just can't do that and consume the standard American diet or high carb diet all the time. You can't. It's impossible. You cannot have low insulin while eating carbs and sugar. It's not possible. So that's my advice for that. Um, you know, start out with a keto adaptation. Don't fast at all at first. Let your body, you know, become accustomed to fat burning, you know, from what you're eating. That's when you can start upping the fasts and getting to the point where you can fucking burn your fat, body fat off that you've been putting away for years and years. So... Oh, Leonardo, kiss Durin, kiss Durin. I'm just going to call you, call you Leo from now on, you know, because I suck at names and shit. Whenever I get hungry and about to break my fast, I take salt. Helps a lot. That is a true story, too. If you're having energy crises or headaches or other um, issues that can be an electrolyte thing, you do need a healthy dose of salt, potassium, and magnesium. Um, there's plenty of different ways of doing that. Uh, I don't recommend supplements. I recommend dietary uh, means of doing that, but that's just me. Um, if it works for you, if you find a way to get your electrolytes, do whatever works best for you to, to, to do that. Then Leo writes, OMAD makes me crave food after eating a huge meal. I rather fast through it and eat after 30 to 40 hours. So, let's see, OMAD always makes me feel I screwed up. Now, yeah, that's an issue with, um, you do feel like you're overdoing it on one meal a day. You feel like that you're just being a complete glutton and that no matter how much you're eating, you, you seem like you, you're still hungry for a while. And you got to give your time, food time to settle. That's, that's one of the things. You need at least 30 minutes um, for your hormones to realize that you just had a huge meal. Um, but you don't have to do one meal a day. You could do a four-hour eating window and have a couple of meals, you know, and just kind of eat for a while and be content. In fact, sometimes I would recommend that because you can have the initial meal and then, you know, wait three hours. And then if you're still hungry, eat appropriately. Um, one meal a day, cramming all your calories in one meal becomes difficult if you are highly physically active because then you can get into that territory where you're not taking up in enough energy to cover you know and this is in a high insulin state that this becomes an issue when you are a carb burner especially it's an issue um you're not taking in enough energy and then your metabolism can drop and you can gain weight even on keto this can happen um so you got to be careful with your energy balance while you're doing this the your fat loss should come entirely from your fasting. Um, it should not be through caloric restriction during your eating windows. You should be eating enough to cover your, you know, the day that you're eating, pretty much. So if you're doing one meal a day, you should be like, and you walked a thousand calories worth of walk in on top of your BMR, which is like 2,000, 2,200, 1,600 for some less fortunate individuals. And, you know, you have to take in enough food. And sometimes you can't do it on one meal a day. And that's when you would want to do like, a, if you're really athletic and you're really hardcore, I would say 16 and 8 is, is probably a good, you know, regimen or ADF. And, and the reason I say ADF is because, you know, it, it takes a while for your metabolism to slow and ramp up. It can take two or three days for your body to go, hey, what the fuck? And, you know, the reason ADF is efficient is you can eat your face off one day. Um, and if you're doing keto, you're metabolically balanced enough to be, to be able to do that. So... That is what it is and shit. Let's see here. VR for life. I'm an athlete, run and lift, 
can even see abs, but have signs of pre-diabetic, have done two 90-hour fasts, should I go longer, sort of want to try, I plan on going keto as well permanently. Um, the amount of body fat you're carrying is an important part of a fast. If you are fasting with a low body fat count, um, you can start burning your lean mass and get into starvation territory and then you'll just eat your face off in response and gain back any weight you or you may lost or remake any fat that you burn off um if you're going keto is definitely one of the important things that you should be doing as an athlete Uh, i in my opinion um you may suffer some performance issues if you go through your glycogen too quickly you know because you do still carry glycogen when you are keto you just carry a lot less of it um, which means you can't you know do high intensity shit for long durations you can do endurance all fucking day but you know high intensity exercise you're limited a little more on keto um you know you have to give yourself time through gluconeogenesis to make more glycogen because you're you're probably sitting at a quarter to half in your glycogen tank when you are ketogenic as far as fasting you can do up to you know a 48 hour fast a 72 hour fast um even a five day fast you probably have enough body fat for that um if you can see your abs i wouldn't if you can see your ab definition i would not go past five days of fasting because it, you're at like six or eight percent body fat and and what it sounds to me like you're trying to target your fatty liver or your visceral fat which you probably have if you're having pre-diabetic condition so in my opinion you know if i were in your shoes if i was an athlete experiencing pre-diabetic condition i would switch to a ketogenic diet i would eat enough energy to cover my workouts if i was athletic and I would sprinkle in shorter fasts or alternate day fasting to burn through the fat in the fatty liver and, the, you know, the fat that's floating around. Because you're probably, you sound like one of them types that might be in that category that doesn't make new fat cells that can only hold so much fat before it spills over and you become insulin resistant. So that's my advice there if, if I were in your shoes um you've done two 90 hour fast i would not go longer than that you know five days would be the max if you can see your abs already um if you want to do a longer fast you honestly need to gain some weight before you do that and do it in a healthier way than don't sugar sugar's not it sugar goes directly to liver fat by the way um that bypasses this whole process of overstuffing your fucking fat cells you know, when you consume fructose, you are going straight to de novo lipogenesis. You're making bad fat, and that bad fat is getting stuck in and around your liver, and it's got a direct pipeline into your arteries, and that's where that fat goes when you're consuming sugar. So that's the main thing as an athlete you should get rid of. Um, also, I would recommend reading up on Tim Noakes and researching Tim Noakes. He was a runner an athlete he studied you know all of the science involved in this and he used to be the you know eat more carbs and run and exercise shit um you should start rather intently following tim noakes if you're an athlete and you can see your abs and you're pre-diabetic because he reversed his diabetes um and he did so without a lot of fasting he mainly did it through a ketogenic diet as far as i know i don't even think tim noakes fasts at all and he was still able to get the health benefits by just using a ketogenic diet and he's been pretty strict with his though he doesn't do cheat days and all of that shit as far as i know all righty minneapolis dave Hey, Scott, got to get back on the road, but no Super Chats on private streams. Something to think about. I had $20 to pay you for Sunday work. Take care. Um, I am aware that these um, patron streams are are not Super Chats. Um, the, the thing is, is I don't 
this is bothering me. I feel like my picture is up in front of this doctor. People are going to mistake me for this doctor. Sorry. That that would be my OCD kicking in right there or whatever the fucking that mental so issue. Is. Oh, I'm even clicking it all goes shit. through this real yeah. fast. Sorry. I got distracted. That was bothering me. Let me fix this. All right. There we go. Let me put that right there and shit. So, um, I know the live streams that I do privately do not have super chat, and but I do. I want to do one of these a month because I promised you guys as as a reward for being patrons already. You're already contributing to the channel financially. Um, I will be doing the live streams for everyone. In which case, if you want to give individually during that point. Um, you can, but th these are one of your perks, uh, for being a patron is me doing these live streams just for you guys to be able to, to keep up with the chat a little more, to talk to you guys a little bit more efficiently. Um, cause you know, sometimes I've, I've had live streams now that had one to 200 people and then the chat rooms just kind of fucking flowing. And I, you know, I'm lucky if I can see anyone or answer anyone's question. And I pretty much can't have a full conversation with anyone at that point. Um, so that that's kind of where where I'm at with that. It's no biggie, you know. I'm I'm surviving. The channel's growing, and I'll keep doing things. There are some things this week, um, you know, that I'm going to be adding for people who want to contribute that to make things a little easier. I've had multiple requests for a mailing address so that you guys can send whatever to me, and you know, I might work that into some videos where I like unbox shit or open shit and talk about things or review um, products that get sent to me and, and, you know, and give my honest opinion. So don't think if you send me something that I'm going to, you know, you know, soften the blow. If I get triggered by something you send me, I'm going to be triggered. And some of you will probably send me shit that'll trigger me. So, you know, that's, that's, don't worry too much about the, uh, when I do the patron only live streams about super chat, because, you know, there'll be opportunities going forward. Steve Ingram, my doctor says I have hypno, hypnotremia or something like that. I think, believe that's a sodium thing. If I remember. Yep, my sodium is just under the lower limit every time. I try to explain my diet and how it's natural to not hold on to as much sodium, but she, ex she insists. Yeah, hyponutremia, that, is, that can happen because our diets have been geared to lower our sodium. You know, most of the foods you buy in the store, they've lowered the sodium in them because, you know, you retain more salt on a high carb diet. And so we need to overcompensate. And I haven't been having any issues. Now, the things I've been doing to keep from, I haven't had cramps in a while now either. Um, the things I've been doing to prevent these issues is, um, I get my potassium from coffee, pecans, spinach, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, magnesium, I, I take uh, magnesium baths for 30 minutes and to, to make sure that it's really good. Sometimes I will drain the bath and let, you know, everything dry on me before I take the shower to rinse off and whatnot. Um, so, and that's very relaxing too. I, I watch videos and shit while I'm doing that. I do research and shit. I listen to audio books, you know, I do whatever, I, but I sit in the tub, I relax you know, soak in the Epsom salt. Epsom salt's like a dollar something at Walmart, you know, for a big thick bag of it. And it gets the job done. It gets that magnesium into your body absorbed through the skin, which is the best way to do it. Because if you do it the other way, you're going to be shitting a lot. And you might not hold on to your salt because you might get in that diarrhea territory where you get dehydrated and you don't have... Because salt is carried in your body fluids if you're not carrying a lot of water weight. Um, the good news is, is once, you know, you become more fat adapted, you do hold on to a few more pounds of water weight than when you first start out. So you will, you know, these symptoms will pass if you're having them, um, up your sodium intake that, you know, take it in pill form. If you have to do bone broth, you know, whatever it takes to get your numbers up, um, add salt to all your foods, you know, that you know this would be what i do if a doctor said hey dickhead you don't have you have low sodium i'd be like well yeah yeah i'm on a ketogenic diet so i might as well fucking do that the doctor isn't gonna know nine times out of ten still doesn't know what the fuck a ketogenic diet is 
Um, if you ex describe it to them, they're going to try and probably give you a statin at some point. So it's, you know, you take it with a grain of salt. Find an open-minded doctor is, is, you know, a doctor that knows their shit, that has done the research, that has clinical... Tr Doctors like this guy right here. Believe it or not, these motherfuckers exist and shit. You know, look at... This guy is a doctor. He treats motherfuckers and he does it the right way. We need more of these. You know, there's only so many Dr. Westmans and Dr. Namans and, you know, Tim Noakes in the world. You know, we need to to get our doctors in, in on board. And, you know, you guys have brought to my attention the this week the articles that have come out on sugar. That's only a part of the the problem. You know, it's it'll be great if we could get sugar down in, in people and lower our incidence of disease. But it's not enough. Just cutting sugar and fructose out of your diet um, while still having lots of high-carb, starchy you know, foods isn't going to reverse the insulin resistance that we've been building. Now, fructose does tank your liver's insulin resistance. Your, your liver becomes inflamed, insulin resistance. It's not taking in glucose. It's not taking in you know anything. And it, you know, that's how your liver ultimately get becomes, you know, dead. It gets cirrhosis is because it's not taking in energy. It can't. It's, you know, the insulin can't push the shit in there. Um, so you know, that's things to keep in mind about the electrolyte issue. Um, you got to keep on top of it. It sucks for a while, but after a while, you'll have your groove. I have my groove. I, you know, I got my seasonings I use. I got my, I do my salt baths. Um, I especially focus on the, the salt baths when doing anything longer than a 48-hour fast. Um, and you can also supplement some of these minerals, but you got to be careful because I think magnesium will send you to the bowl a lot. Um, you can take sodium pills probably as well and, and up your sodium that way, and it does can't hurt. Um, because excess sodium will just get pissed out. That's the, that's the thing. When you're on a ketogenic diet and you overeat, sodium you're gonna piss it out your kidneys are gonna be like yeah nope sorry you got no water to put this shit in and out it'll go so you might even be thirstier or dehydrated it might cause you to retain a little more water if you over consume salt too so it's a whole balancing act and shit Leo, once again, I'm high intensity athlete. I only eat carbs before I work out. You need carbs for fast burst energy. Unfortunately, carbs are not needing for aerobic activities. Um, once you have been thoroughly fat adapted, Leo, you need to keep in mind that you still have glycogen, especially in your muscles. Your muscles retain anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of their glycogen levels while you're keto. And the reason for that is gluconeogenesis is a process going on all the time. And what is happening is excess protein that you're not utilizing to regrow your muscles or, or to, you know, grow new cells gets converted over to glucose, gets popped out into the blood, you know, gets shunted by the insulin spike you get from protein. Um, and along, you know, you with rebuilding your muscle you are also restoring muscle glycogen liver is a different ball game um, because that doesn't hold a lot of glycogen and your brain is sourced from your liver as far as its glucose requirements and it never is down to zero either however what i was talking about is that scale um you know if you are a fat burner and you are fat adapted and you're an athlete even you know you're still balancing that and you've, you've tilted it this way, but you're not like, it's not like you got no fucking glycogen at all. There's no such thing. There's no way your body would survive without a minimal storage of glycogen. What it does mean is you can't spend three hours doing high intensity shit and expect to perform well. Um, you're just not going to, you're going, you can bonk if that is what you're doing. However, you can do sustained, you know, like a marathon and never require glycogen, burn completely fat. And this is all measurable, you know, through the VO2 max or whatever the fuck measurement that they got um, to where you can determine. And Dr. Naiman in this lecture that I cited talks about it um, to where you can figure out which what you are while you're exercising. Even you can go get tested for that, too, if you're interested. Um 
So yeah, you do need some carbs for fast burst energy, but if you are not overdoing those energy, you do not need to eat the carbs to get them. That's the secret nobody wants to tell you. Just because you use carb doesn't mean you need to eat carbs. You make glucose. Your body can convert glycerol, which is derived from fatty acids, and your body can convert protein through gluconeogenesis to create the glycogen. Um, that glycogen, is, while your insulin is up, which will happen if you're eating protein, and I assume if you're athletic, you're eating protein, that will get shunted into your muscles to replace the glycogen. And it will be prioritized because you won't, your muscles won't be stuffed with energy, which is the whole the whole principle of this fucking video is we've overstuffed ourselves. And you just do not need to maintain full glycogen stores to perform. And there are plenty of low-carb ketogenic athletes proving this at this point, some of them setting records, especially endurance on the endurance side of the house. There are ketogenic bodybuilders that are growing tons of muscle doing so efficiently, ripped as shit because they don't carry a lot of body fat, you know, and, you know, it's it's a training adaptation process. This is something you need to adapt to. You're going to suck as an athlete for the first six, you know, probably six months of, of being, you know, because it's a different ball game if you're trying to fat adapt athletically. Um, you need a longer period to be able to function at the level that you might have been at when you were a pure car burning athlete. But you can get there. It is a process. But if you're the kind of person that's patient to build some fucking muscle and to pound that fuck master all fucking day, then sooner or later, you are going to get there. And you will become efficient even when you do high-intensity shit. Um, so you can up your protein. You can overconsume protein a little more than other people, in my opinion. Um, and if you're a bodybuilder, that's what I would do. I wouldn't go back to carbs. I would fat adapt over the long period of time and use protein a little more liberally to replenish the glycogen while not, because if that glycogen's full, you're a carb burner. If you fill up the glycogen in your muscles and you fill up the glycogen in your liver, you are going to shift that scale from fat. Fat's going to come down, glucose is going to go up. And you are going to be a car burner until you reverse that, either with fasting, exercise, or however the hell it is you de deplete your glycogen. Um, so, and most of the fuckmaster pounders are doing that. They're they're constantly doing this, and they're not doing it very efficiently. You know, so that's my thoughts. Uh, Steve, Stephen Eddie, you mentioned red meat being insulogenic more so than other protein heavy foods, or were you speaking generally about excess protein? Excess po protein in general can, um, be insulogenic. However, the reason red meat is more insulogenic is because of the glycogen in that meat. You know, you're eating the animal's muscle. They have muscle glycogen like the rest of us. You are taking in that glycogen, and it, your body is storing it appropriately. That's another thing that's happening. And it's not going to convert it to fat because your glycogen's likely depleted at this point. So it's going to take that glycogen and add it to your glycogen. Um, so that's why you can't overdo it on the protein as well. Is you got to keep in mind that some of the meats that you're eating aren't organ meats. They're muscle meats, and those muscles contain glycogen stores of their own depending on how the animal was fed you know so if you got a high carb factory farm fucking steak you're getting a lot of glycogen because you know they've overstuffed they're, they're doing the same thing to them that we do to ourselves they've overstuffed their energy and you're getting an insulin response for that but because your glycogen is depleted most of the glycogen, because it's not a huge dose. It's not like eating a cookie or, or a piece of bread. It's it's a minor amount of energy from the glycogen in the meats. Um, you also use insulin. Insulin has multiple roles. Insulin does shunt the amino acids to your muscles to rebuild, you know, to build muscle, to grow new cells. Um and, and we can get into autophagy's role in that and uh, human growth hormone and that, that whole deal in the process. But 
you, you just got to, you know, when I'm talking about excess protein, it is more along the lines of, you know, how much glycogen's in that protein. Um, you're not going to significantly ramp up gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is pretty much a constant. There, there was a study, I forget that I'd have to look it up. There was a study that showed this, that gluconeogenesis pretty much remains constant regardless of what you are, are eating. Um, but it's more of a carb load situation. If you eat a shit ton of, uh, you know, protein, then you have a shit ton of protein to convert to glucose and to store as glycogen. So that's one of the reasons you need to keep protein in moderation. Um, I don't always do it. You know, if I have one vice on the ketogenic diet, it is I'll sit down and eat 12 wings, which is way more protein than you need, or I'll have four or five eggs sometimes, and that's a shit ton of protein, and I'll put cheese in them fucking eggs, and then, so, I, I'm not a moderate protein motherfucker, I'm, but I definitely nail the high fat, I do a lot of fat, so, it is what it is, how are we doing on time here? Okay, we've been at this about an hour, so I'm gonna wrap this up with a couple more questions and then be on my way and shit um debra not going to pound any fuck masters but i'm going to start some weight training only moderately though to regain some of the muscle tone i seem to have misplaced don't plan on upping the carbs though and you shouldn't yeah i am of the opinion that with a goal like that where you're not a, a competitive athlete or a bodybuilder or an elite motherfucker and you just want to tone up a bit stick with the diet and do it and you you can do it it's been done. It, it's not a big issue. You don't need to bust your ass. Um, obviously, if you want lots of gains, you got to do the work. But um, if you're just looking to tone up and to, to make things a little tighter and make muscles bulge a little more and that kind of stuff, um, a couple times a week, you know, it, it, you don't need to, to go nuts with the, the exercise. You don't need to go five times a week to do that. You could go for a half hour, two or three times a week. You know, some people do this, they exercise once a week for 30 minutes, and that's the extent of their exercise. And that, in my opinion, is enough to maintain what you got. Um, muscle will go away if you don't use it. doesn't matter if you're eating a lot, no matter what you're eating. If you sit on your ass and you don't exercise, muscle atrophies. It's just a fact of life. And if you're fasting, muscle will atrophy if you're not using it. You have to use the muscle if, to keep it. Because you're, especially when you're fasting, your body's looking around. Hey, we ain't using that. Let's eat that shit. So, and that's about it, I think. Um, you guys are, thanks again for coming out. Thanks again for you guys for supporting me through Patreon and keeping this channel growing. We saw a big spike in subscribers this week. Uh, we, like, I got 500 in a very short period of time. Um... So actually, we got one more question. Let's let's do one more. Do you track macros or calories, or can you eyeball it because you've been doing it for so long? Um, I don't track that so much. I do keep an eye on my carbs, but I, you know, I'm not very complicated with the foods I eat, so I kind of know my carbs are anywhere from thirty to fifty grams a day. Um, which is, you know, the upper end of where you, where you should be. You know, a lot of people do 20 and 30 grams of carbs a day. Carbs are about the only thing I concern myself with. If I read a food label, I eyeball it, I see, you know, is this a high-carb food, which in which case I have a small fucking portion, or is this a low-carb food? I do not count calories. I do not give a shit about calories. I don't track my macros either, to be honest with you. I let my body do its job. And the more you let your body do its job, the better it gets at that job. And that job is regulating your energy balance itself. If you take in the right kinds of foods and you eat to satiety, um, and you eat a lot of fat with those foods, you don't have to overdo it. You don't have to go nuts. Initially, it helps get you into fat burning mode. But once you're there and you can efficiently jump back and forth between body fat and the fat you eat, it becomes less necessary to load up on fat. However, if you're still having a lot of hunger, fat is what you need to increase. Um, that Because that means you're not quite efficient at burning, switching over to burning your body fat. 
So you need to be able to fucking, you know, switch back and forth efficiently. That's what the whole keto adaptation, the six weeks, is for, is to get you to that point. And that's why carb cycling and cheat days don't factor well into this, because you set yourself back in this realm. You will become hungrier. You will crave more. You will have energy crises. You will have that emotional roller coaster thing. Um, so you got to stick with long bouts of ketosis and a ketogenic diet to get the most benefit. Um, I don't believe in weekly carb cycling. I don't believe in, you know, every time you exercise in carb cycling. I believe every once in a great while, even as an athlete, you could probably do this, you know, maybe once a month have a carb up. And by carb up, I don't mean pizza, McDonald's binge. I mean, have some, you know, pasta or potatoes, you know, no sugar, no fructose, none of that shit, you know, once a month max and i don't even do that i don't want to do that you know i i want to go six to eight weeks in between my my carb ups if i even choose to do them at all um and usually it's my social life that that pressures me to to break that shit so that was it that's my last question uh deborah said i'll be i'd say it'll be three or four times a week not looking for gains here have a good rest of your day thanks for the wealth of information and leo said thanks see you soon or see you again and shit all right so that's it for the q a please like and subscribe for more shit for those of you watching this via youtube um i do a daily blog on patreon you can of course uh keep up with what i'm doing there that way and um you know for a dollar a month that's not a lot you know and uh you know the more people we get doing that the more of this i can do the more videos i can produce um, I'm a little overwhelmed work-wise, so I'm probably only doing three, maybe four videos this week. I've been also working on increasing my ability to, um, produce better content. I'm getting sick of this fucking background here. This is bothering me. I, you know, for a live stream, this is okay, but I'm, every video I've been filming, it, it's been kind of, you know meh and this camera that i'm using right here is great for run and gun vlogging and and occasional you know quick video making because it's very efficient very stabilized it can move around easily and shit um and it's great for streaming however i have these you know cameras with much better glass a much larger sensor so I decided, and I've been experimenting over this weekend, you know, in my spare time, of which there hasn't been much, um, with a way to green screen. Um, so where I can use my photography abilities and, uh, you know, I'm getting back into my 3D graphics to increase the production quality and video quality of this channel. So that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm working hard to, to grow this channel. And as I can dedicate more time, I can make higher quality videos. The, you know, once I'm able to drop Uber, I can go out into the world and film more and do some more documentary style films that require a lot more editing, um, a lot more production time, maybe even people to help out with here and there. And that is the goal. I want to interview people that are trying this. I want to try and do some, you know, collaborations. I want to travel and kind of, you know, apply my minimalism lifestyle and my health, you know, healthy way of living to the constant barrage of social situations we get. And, you know, there's there's things I want to get out there and film, but that require even more time than I spend now. And I'm spending at least 30 to 40 hours a week producing content for you guys and researching. So I want to be able to not have to go above and beyond um, with other income streams. And you guys are, are contributing to that through Patreon. And for those of you who are watching the ads and contributing that way, that's fine. I don't, you know, as long as that doesn't go away, it could. You know, I haven't ruled out that my ad revenue could go bye-bye. Um, but for now, it's it's holding. Um, it's not setting the world on fire by any means. You know, I just had a video that went to 15,000 views, and I made, like, fucking six bucks off of it. And I'm like, hmm, 
Yeah, it makes sense. The watch time was about the same. But then again, I had another video with only 4,000 views that made me 60 bucks through ad revenue. So I don't know how, quite how that works. I do know it's not reliable. So the you guys on Patreon, you know, Patreon have made it more reliable. This week I will be, on my first video I produced this week, I will be releasing a, a few new things. You, you will be able to follow my photography on Instagram um, as, as I look to become more faithful about posting on Instagram. Um, I will release my uh, mailing address to where you can send shit to um, this, this week, the first video. And, you know, I just got one last thing I want to square away before I release that. And once I do that, you guys will have access to pretty much the entirety of everything I do at that point, um, as far as my photography and, my, you know, my other side gig, which is photography. Um, and I want to share that with you guys, because, you know, I think, I think I'm ready to do that. And the reason I didn't before was I was worried that I wouldn't get clients because I say fuck, you know, and I pound a fuck master and fucking, you know, all that shit. I, I worried that that would scare off photo clients. Um, as I'm doing this a lot more than that, they're just going to have to put up with me. You know, if they want me to go and, and work with them, they're just going to have to realize that this channel is more important to me than whether or not they hire me. So that's kind of where I'm at and why I'm finally cross-pollinating my photography onto the channel. And then we can get into other shit from then on out. So I realize I've been bullshitting a little while here. So thank you guys for coming out. Thank you guys for watching who didn't make it to the live stream. I will do another live stream this week for everyone. I'm not sure on a date and time yet. I have to. I have some things up in the air right now that I need to make room for happening. So I'll squeeze it off. If not, it'll be next Sunday. Um, if I'm not busy, I will do a... I'm, I'm aiming for Sundays kind of being the laid back, you know, do a live stream days and shit. So... Remember, I'm not a motherfucking expert. I'm just a motherfucking asshole and shit. So uh, as I sit here and try to prep... Oh, shit. No, that's not what I want. Oops. No, don't want that. There we go. Yeah, I'm setting up for, to, to run some credits at the end of this, you know, because... Can't have a Scott the Truck Driver video without fucking credits and shit. There we go. Alright, let's put that up. Alrighty. So now that I've uh, wasted some time and you've probably already stopped the video, I'm going to run some credits and that'll be that. So...